Right, good afternoon. Let's get started. Welcome everybody. I see a lot of new faces. Uh, just so you know, this happens every Thursday. So if you just are lost, don't have anything interesting to do, just show up here at 5.15 or 4.45 if you want coffee cookies. Uh, our speaker next week is actually not a speaker, it's a panel, it's a very special event. Uh, it's going to be on energy infrastructure with architectural and civil engineers. And we will have five panelists, uh, very established, known faculty in the civil engineering department. Uh, Richard Corsi, Lance Manuel, Attila Novoselak, Kara Cockleman, Charles Worth, and Kevin Folliard. And they'll talk to us about uh, what type of research and education is going on related to energy and environment in civil engineering. That uh, should be very interesting. Please uh, join us. You are in for a special delight today. Uh, it's, it's a great pleasure to introduce my colleague, Dr. Jay Banner. Uh, Jay is the F.M. Bullard Professor in the Department of Geological Sciences. He is also the director, founding director of the Environmental Sciences Institute, which is a, an organized research unit on campus that fosters interdisciplinary research and education in environmental uh, sciences. Jay's research interests center on Earth surface processes, including climate and hydrologic processes. Uh, when it comes to teaching, he is a very big uh, innovator. He is one of the most special teachers we have on campus, and personally, one of the greatest teachers I've actually encountered. And this talk itself was, when I was in the audience listening him give this talk, I was really, truly inspired. So uh, I hope some of that inspiration will actually uh, come back alive again. Uh, among many of his teaching innovations are the famous Heart Science School Talk Outreach series, series, which happens thrice a semester on Friday uh, afternoons. Uh, I don't know if you have been there, but uh, it's something truly remarkable. That includes a whole range of uh, participants from researchers, students, to K through 12 students, to teachers, to parents. It's, it's really amazing on a, on a really important uh, range of uh, issues. Uh, and then also the G, GK12 program, which partners STEM graduate student researchers with K through 12 teachers. Uh, and this all fosters multiple levels of interactions between graduate students, researchers, and K-12 students and teacher. In 2011, he has a long list of awards, which I'm not going to go through, but I do want to mention that in 2012, he was inducted into the University of Texas Academy of Distinguished Teachers. Uh, so it's such a pleasure to have you, Jay. I'll call you up in just a uh, minute. There are a couple of things I want to uh, note here. For those of you who are uh, coming in for the first time, there's a sign-up sheet at the end. If you just want to put your name and email, you, you want to be on our mailing list. Uh, and also, I want to mention that this is a co-sponsored event by a student group, TEMSA, Texas Energy Management uh, Association for uh, Energy. Uh, TEMSA students, if you're in room, please raise your hand. Right, so you, uh, the group is uh, right here. Uh, thank you for joining us, and if you have your own group that wants to co-sponsor, uh, there, is, there is no uh, resources or funds that are involved. We still take care of everything, but you kind of help us think through this and organize and uh, do the outreach and bring your own student group and have uh, this interaction. So thanks again, Temsa, for uh, joining and co-sponsoring. With that, I want to turn this over to Jay. Can you hear me now? Okay. Anybody miss what I said? Didn't, it was nonsense anyway. All right, so I want to talk to you today about past, present, and future Texas climate change, science, and policy. You know, the, the projections are for Texas's climate in the 21st century to undergo change. The change ranges, according to the, the published reports and the, and the data and the projections, the change ranges from quote-unquote significant to quote-unquote unprecedented. And that's what I'd like to go through with you today, talk about it from a science perspective and also uh, my brush up with a policy perspective on this. So before I get going, I want to hand out these index cards. Um, so those of you who have taken class with me, uh, I lo love how all the blood just drained from your face. When those of you who haven't taken class with me, I won't tell you what we do with them, but um, everyone just take one and uh, we'll use them later. 
So the principal questions I, I would like to address are how has Texas's climate changed in the past? How does this compare with projections for the 21st century? What are the impacts of these changes and how can we avoid or minimize these impacts? So that's where we're going and the outline is, we'll first talk about climate change impacts uh, in terms of national security. Uh, this grew out of a uh, uh, conference that Varun and I participated in in which uh, visiting heads of states from various countries wanted to learn, not heads of states, but members of state departments wanted to learn about climate change impacts on national security. That was my first foray into the combination of them and Varun spoke about energy and national security. Then we'll talk about paleoclimate, how we can reconstruct it and the results for Texas. And then we'll come back to climate change impacts in terms of specific costs to Texas. We'll have projections for the 21st century as I mentioned. And then we'll talk to you about the state's plan of action for addressing these changes. And I'll finish with some opinions. I'll offer you mine, and I'll be very interested to hear yours. All right, well, climate change impacts national security. Uh, the disclaimer is I have no background or expertise in national security. And uh, as I said, I got it from that conference, and um, really everything I know about national security does come from this uh, TV series Homeland. I have, <laughs> I've heard it's actually quite accurate in terms of the portrayal. So um, I've watched a few seasons of it, so I'm ready to go with national security. So climate change and security, there are some fundamental risks. There's a degradation of soil from climate change, impacts on the security of food supply, extreme events and evacuation and migration, how people move from one, one region or one country to another as a result of extreme events of climate change, the, the costs associated, and uh, and that impacts on national security of the costs of mitigating, adapting, and or taking no action. Those are the choices we have to adapt to the changes that are coming, to try to mitigate against the changes that are coming, or the costs of not doing anything. And a common essential component of all of these national security threats of climate change is water. So the U.S. Department of Defense uh, this, this fiscal year laid out their climate change roadmap. The department has established three broad adaptation goals, identify and assess the effects of climate change of the department, integrate climate change considerations across the department, and collaborate with internal and stake, external stakeholders on climate change risks. So how many of you think this is a uh, relatively conservative approach to take with climate change and impacts on national security? All right, thank you, one, and two, three, four. How many think it's not a conservative approach? It needs to be changed. All right, 5% five, 5 total voting. That's uh, pretty good. Um, you know, go ahead and uh, put down number one on your index card. Number one will be, do you think this is a conservative approach? Simply one, and then yes or no. Or, I don't know, I'm not equipped to answer this question. Those are your three choices. We'll be collecting these later. You may leave them anonymous or not. You didn't, who didn't get an index card? Wow, how, how did, are there any left? Thank you. There's a few left that might not make it all the way there. So, you know what? You just have a piece of paper on you. Pull a piece of paper out of your notebook. That'll do fine. Or you can uh, split your card and share it with your neighbor. You can cut it in half. It's no, there's no need to panic. It will get solved. If you have something to write on, use it. If not, don't. We're going to move on. All right. So. Does everyone hear the question? The question is, when I ask you the question, is this a conservative, do you consider this a conservative approach? Is it liberal versus conservative or is it methodical? Is it, is it judicious enough? Is it considerate enough? Or is it way off, way off the chain, All right? So judicial, judicious, careful logic and thinking, well thought out, that's conservative. Off the chain would not be conservative, okay. So that's for the U.S. Department of Defense. Um, there's actually ongoing now an Iran-U.S. Visitor Leadership Program today and tomorrow, uh, managing the effects of and opportunities of climate change with goals of exchanging ideas with regard to these challenges posed by climate change, including the stuff we listed before just for national security. So there's this delegation from Iran here and visiting. I'll be meeting with them tomorrow and talking to them about climate change and associated risks. And uh, I think the goals here are actually quite similar to some of the goals here at the U.S. Department of Defense. 
All right, so stepping back from that now, and I wonder if there's, if there's a way we can make the, the lights darker for these couple of slides. Do I have the control of that up here? I will try to, try to do that. Just lights. Thanks. All right, so here's a uh, satellite view of uh, the United States. Thank you. It looks very good. Excellent. Uh, you, could, you could see this sort of uh, what everybody probably intuitively knows if you've looked at any images like this, right? There's a lush green southeast humid U.S. There is the relatively brown arid southwest U.S., right? It's a real uh, boundary between these two uh, climate provinces, if you will. And the boundary is somewhere right along in here. Right? If you look pretty closely, ask where is Austin on here? Well, if you look, here's the Balcones Escarpment. Here's San Antonio, Austin, Dallas, Fort Worth up here. This arc, here's the Edwards Plateau. And then the Colorado River coming through this down. Where the Escarpment and the, and the Colorado River cross, that's where we are right now. And so you can see that is pretty much right on the boundary between the humid southeast and the arid southwest U.S. Right? And if you were all to... Uh, extend your arms this way without hitting anyone in front of you or behind you, right? Your right arm would be out to, the, out to the west, and your left arm would be out to the east, and somewhere then bisecting your body would be that east-west boundary of, from between the humid and arid parts of our country, right? It's not an exact boundary like that. I'm exaggerating. But if you felt so compelled and you wanted to feel that, you could stretch your arms out now and do that. And wait for three, two. It would be more this way because that's, that's our east-west. All right, did you feel it? All right. Well, let's zoom in on this. This is the uh, <clears throat> view of the vegetation. Again, satellite image, normalized difference vegetation index. It's uh, converting satellite data to uh, vegetation health imagery. And what you can see is the green areas are healthy, the brown areas are either vegetation absent or not healthy. And where can we locate ourselves again? Here's the Balcones Escarpment. Here's the Colorado River meandering through here. All right, so again, you can see we're right around the, the boundary. We're zoomed in on it now in Texas, and this is the one of the last days in August in 2010, fully a year before the uh, peak of the drought of, that started in 2011. I'm going to roll the clock forward a full year, and now we're going to look at it at the end of August in, uh, in 2011. This is the first time I've ever given this presentation and show this, probably given this two dozen times, where there wasn't a visible audible gasp coming from the audience for that difference. It's okay, we'll load it up again. <laughs> well, if you didn't feel that or think that, you probably sh should have been emblazoned on your retinas that this is something uh, quite, quite significant. I could stand here all day, and I will until 6.15, <laughs> just doing this until the point is driven home. This is actually a very significant difference. And we'll, we'll quantify how significant it was in terms of vegetation health, and we'll try to put a, actually a cost on it in a little while. Okay, and I want to bring up a little bit of history in this area. You know, we're not the first people to notice this big boundary between the southeast and southwest U.S. and this climatic control on this province change. It was John Wesley Powell, who was a geologist and explorer, a professor at Illinois Wesleyan University and a soldier in the Civil War, founded the U.S. Geological Survey, the Bureau of Ethnology, and uh, quite a remarkable fellow. He was one of the first people, or the, really the first person, as a result of exploring all over the western U.S., he noticed just what a difference there was and that the land was not going to be able to handle the development that it's seen uh, now in the future. And he warned against this, and he testified to Congress, and he said, we actually need to come up with a land management plan for the western U.S. Imagine that, how prescient that was. Uh, he saw this coming. But so did the uh, railroad companies, who had a bigger voice in terms of uh, lobbying in Congress than he did, and his policies were actually never put into effect. Uh, a common term uh, he used is the 100th meridian, that's a line of longitude that separates the, the east from the western U.S., he said, gentlemen, you are piling up a heritage of conflict and litigation over water rights. There is not sufficient water to supply the land. Again, very much ahead of his time. Um, so a little bit of homage to John Wesley Powell. Um, he uh, 
lost his uh, right arm in the Battle of Shiloh, uh, giving the order to charge, and it was shot off. And he then took a break from the army, uh, re-enlisted. He was on the Union side, and then the uh, Siege of Vicksburg. He spent a lot of time in the trenches, and like any good geologist, actually when he was in the trenches, he was looking at the rock outcrops in the, in the trenches. Quite a, quite a gentleman. I think he was also way ahead of his time in having uh, the requisite hipster facial hair that we see very common today. He's so far ahead of his time that this hasn't come in yet, wearing pants as high-waisted as you can be, very much in contrast to the low bagginess that uh, we now experience. So if you want to be a, really a hipster and be way ahead of your time, start investing in these. All right, well, <clears throat> here is a map of <clears throat> this map of Texas. Again, the lush vegetation, the arid province to the west. Here is the 100-degree uh, west line of longitude, the 100th meridian. And what you could see, what's shown here, are these cities that are going to, and these re regions with counties that have greater than 50% population growth between now and 2050. The population of Texas will double by the year 2065. We have to ask the question if we are facing uh, less water availability and a doubling of the population, where will all the water come from that we need in Texas? And these cities that will be growing so rapidly are straddling this uh, 100th meridian. Rio Grande Valley, San Antonio, San Marcos, the fastest growing city in the U.S., 8% population increase per year, Austin, Dallas, Fort Worth. So that's a view, a snapshot of the present, and now I want to go back in the past and reconstruct past climate change for Texas. And we first might ask, who cares? What, who really cares what happened a long time ago before there were a lot of people around in, in Texas and before we were here? Does it really matter? Well, if you can look at the past, it might be prologue for the future. There may be times in the past, and in fact there were, where there are larger magnitude, larger rates of change than the change that we see today and uh, around the globe and in Texas in in particular. So a lot of times you hear that maybe we're just looking at natural cycles today in terms of our climate change. Well, in order to know any of this, you have to reconstruct the pre-anthropogenic baseline before humans were here to, to disturb the climate, to alter the climate. You have to know what that baseline is to see if what we're experiencing now perhaps is part of a natural cycle or otherwise. So thanks. So how can we reconstruct past climate change? We could do it in a number of ways. And uh, let's go through a little bit of uh, language. First, we want to talk about present-day climate. And we're going to call that the instrumental record because that's when instruments have been around. Uh, thermometers, rain gauges, and whatnot, that's how we actually monitor climate today, of course. It seems simple, but uh, going back about 100 years, those instrumental records are quite valuable. Back when we get to the late 1800s, they start falling apart. The instruments weren't so good. The record keeping wasn't so good etc. So we need something before we go back uh, be, be older than the late 1800s to reconstruct past change and for that we use these proxy records. Proxy just like a proxy vote. If you're not going to be around you give someone your proxy to vote. Well no one was around during a lot of these ancient times so we have things such as sedimentary rocks, corals, tree rings, ice cores and speleothems that offer us a means to reconstruct past climate. So we'll go through a couple of examples of these and apply them to Texas. And then when we look at future climate, we're going to be talking about model simulations. These are complex numerical codes, computer models that simulate atmospheric circulation. And if you change parameters, if you think you know how greenhouse gas concentrations like CO2 in the Earth's atmosphere are going to change, if we go forward with a, what we call a business as usual scenario and uh, double CO2 by a certain time this century compared to pre-industrial CO2, then we could uh, run the complex numerical models to simulate how climate will change as a result of parameter changes such as greenhouse gases, et cetera. All right, so with that, one way we reconstruct past climate is by looking at tree rings. You're probably really familiar with this. The oldest rings are in the center. The youngest rings are at the margin, right? And so now we'll take a microscopic view through a slice through a, through a tree. And we're going to look at the sequence from the oldest part of the tree to the youngest part of the tree. We're going to walk through the sequence. And when we get to the uh, wettest part of this record, please tell me when to stop. Wow, right on. That was much higher rate percentage of participation. That's great. That tells me you know everything about this. So I'll quickly move on to other types of uh, paleoclimate records. Right, it's going to, so tree rings tell us about available moisture. When the rings are thicker, it was moisture, more available water. All right, here's a view from into a cave, into a devil sinkhole in West Texas. 
And uh, this is, I don't recommend this as a place to learn how to repel. That was a really bad experience for me. And going down into these caves, what we're ultimately after are mineral deposits that grow from water dripping into the cave. So rain falls from the sky, it infiltrates through the soil, infiltrates through the limestone, and then drips into the, pore, the large pore space known as a cave. And that mineral deposit grows incrementally over time. 50 microns per year is a pretty fast growing um, rate of change. So speleothems offer us the advantage over trees in that if we find a tree in central Texas for our dendrochronology studies and it's 500 years old, we get pretty excited. You know, we might open up a, a bottle of beer. But a, a speleothem would just mock that, would just laugh at that age. Speleothems can grow continuously over tens of thousands of years. So I'll show you a speleothem in a minute. A speleothem this tall in a cave from central Texas might have grown over 70,000 years. So just a mineral deposit, just a chunk of the mineral calcite. Think about what that means. We're able to date them through a radiometric dating process. I won't spend time. Anyone who's interested, I'll share with you, with you later. But the, as the water, as it rains more, more water drips into the ground, into the cave, and the rate of growth increases. That's a first order approximation. Our study's shown it's more complicated than that. However, these things have been and can be used as paleo rain gauges. We can maybe tell times of great drying in the past. We could tell something about sources of moisture, etc. If you just think about it, just step back. 70,000 years, that means at that one spot in the cave, water continuously dripped over 70,000 years. How many people think at 3 in the morning they're going to wake up and this is just going to be racing through their mind that you could actually tell that? If so, sit, write down 3 a.m. on your card if you think you, you, you will want to know that feedback. All right, so speleothems <clears throat> come from the Greek root speleology, the Greek root of that, the word speleon means cave. So speleology is the study of caves. This is a, one type of speleothem. It's a stalagmite. So the stalagmites are the ones that might make it up to the ceiling. I never remember. I have to start over with this every time. They might make it up to the ceiling one day, and the stalactites are the ones that hang tight to the ceiling. Right? So this slice through a stalagmite shows you these lines of equal age, incremental growth through time. And so finishing the definition, speleothems has the same Greek root, spelea meaning cave. Them means them things. So speleothems are them things that grow in caves. Thank you for laughing. You're only encouraging me to <laughs> keep doing this when I give this talk. Um, as long as I get one laugh, I'll, I'll do it again. All right, so what we're doing in these caves, because of the complexities of, uh, it sounded simple, rain falls from the sky, infiltrates through the soil, infiltrates through the limestone, falls on that formation, and grows. There's a whole set of processes that can happen between the water interacting with the soil, with the limestone, and then Gases leaving the water as it enters the cave, CO2 exolving from the water, flowing over the formation. There's all kinds of chemical and isotopic changes that can occur. And what we're trying to do is best understand how those changes record changes in climate by doing experiments in these caves, by growing calcite experimentally on these substrates placed under active drips in the caves. Anyone who's interested in learning more about that, I'll be happy to share with you information. Let me show you a couple of these uh, paleoclimate indicators. This is a Douglas fir tree from Arizona. And you'll be able to pass this around. You'll be able to see the rings and tell when there were wet periods and when there were dry periods. I'll also pass this around. This is a speleothem, the general term. And if you came into the cave, it might be a stalagmite if it was growing upward, or it might be a stalactite if it was hanging tight to the ceiling. And that's what it would look like in the cave. But if you sliced it and polished it, you might see lines of equal age, much like in a tree ring. All right, so I'm going to pass this around. And actually, what I want to know from you, is this a mite or is it a tight? You could write that on your card, or you could get inspired. Um, like Varun said, you might get inspired. If you are, just shout it out uh, randomly at any time if you're inspired to do that. It might be a tight. Good shout. All right. So, those are speleothems. Are we missing, are we missing any, any kind of uh, paleoclimate record? Anyone you guys think of? You good from now? Ice cores? Yeah, I got one of those as well from Greenland. Greenland ice core here. <laughs> oh, man, I forgot the cooler. N NSF will never fund me again. All right, someone clap. That's, 
You're just encouraging me. I'm just going to do it again in the future. All right, so let's go to the recent past and future climate of Texas. Here are two papers that have come out in the literature over the past decade, just about. The first one in Science in 2007 said model projections of an imminent transition to a more arid climate in southwestern North America. That means these climate model projections are projecting that there will soon be a change to a more arid climate in southwestern North America. And this one that came out just in February of this year, unprecedented 21st century drought risk, in the American Southwest and Central Plains. So let's look into what's behind these headlines. These are not newspaper headlines. These are peer-reviewed scientific literature. Yet it looks like it was rip, ripped from the headlines, doesn't it? So let's look at this site in West Texas. We're going to look at the drought index on the y-axis. In this case, PDSI. It's not important what the units are, but what's important is negative numbers mean drought, positive numbers mean wet. If you want to cheat, just look at the right-hand y-axis, dry down, wet up. And this are two panels here going from the year 1050 to the year 1350, and then the year 1800 to the year 2100. So first we'll look at the projections. That's the green curve, and that's from these uh, computer models of atmospheric circulation called uh, climate models. And what they're showing is a trend of decreasing, um, <clears throat> decreasing wetness, increasing aridity, and you can see anytime you're below the zero line, you're in a drought condition. All right, so that's what the imminent shift in the title of those articles were, imminent shift to more arid conditions. You could see basically the mean state of the climate during the 21st century is that of drought. All right, this is saying the projection is saying drought will be the new normal, wet periods will be the exception. Okay, so let's now look, turn to the observations, see what we could learn from them. The observations are, this is the red curve here, and the red is just a uh, running mean smoothing out the blue data, which are the higher resolution data. So we'll just look at the red curve. And uh, what do you think that those observations are based on? Tree rings? Boom. Okay. In fact, tree rings, uh, yes, indeed. And for the 20th century, it's the instrumented record. Back before the 20th century, we only have the tree rings to, to rely on. Okay. So let's see what we could see. There seemed to be a dry period here, a pretty dry period in the 1800s. Um, I'll be happy to point you to some of our papers which show that there is a decadal scale drought every century going back to the 1500s, then picking it up here in this older part of the record. Look at what's happening in the 1100s. Look at these droughts here. This one is going from about 1125 uh, to about 1160, maybe. It's a 30-year drought. Another one, another one. Look what's happening in the 1200s. So we go from here to here. This is almost the second half of the 13th century. We're almost entirely in a drought there call these mega droughts. They're 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 year droughts. Um, quite an extended period. <clears throat> this is for West Texas, but you'll see similar records. You can see in the literature similar records for the entire Southwest US. If you're familiar with the civilizations that uh, lived in Chaco Canyon, um, those uh, early Native Americans living there at the time, this was the time that they abandoned uh, their settlements in the 12th and 13th century. So this is actually quite an extended record of dryness. But now let's consider the drought that we use for water planning in Texas. That's this thing called the drought of record. The 1950s drought is a six-year drought, and it's the only drought that occurred during the time of the instrumental record, except for the 2011 drought, which we'll talk about later. This is the drought of record, quote unquote, is what the state uses for its water planning. So the Texas Water Development Board, charged with providing water for all Texans 50 years out, uses this drought of record as the worst case scenario. What do we mean by worst case scenario? Well, it's charged with providing water for all Texans 50 years out. The caveat to that, 50 years out, should the worst case scenario recur. And the worst case scenario that's used here is this 1950s drought, okay? How many of you think that this is a conservative approach for planning? Think it's conservative approach, think it's taking all exigencies into account, taking all scenarios into account, planning for the worst and hoping for the best? Is this planning for the worst by saying this is the worst thing that could happen? Or might this be planning for the worst? The state does not use these data, it only uses these data. 
So I want you to write on your card, uh, you've started with, uh, with uh, whether or not the U.S. Department of Defense and what Iran is doing in terms of climate change, whether that's conservative or not. I'd like you to say whether or not this compares. Is this conservative or is this not conservative in our definition, right? This is not liberal. This is not blue-red state. We're in a red state, but ignore that. We're asking, is this a conservative approach? All right. So now let's consider, given these events that we've seen in the past, what the costs might be. And full, full disclosure, I'm not an economist. I've never taken a business course in my life. Everything I know is from the TV show Shark Tank, it's how to evaluate businesses and going forward in time. So that's uh, all my background I'm going to bring to this, but I won't let that stop me. So the 1950s drought impacts, that six-year drought, is each year without drought cost the Texas economy $3.5 billion. That's in today's dollars. Okay. Crops were depleted up to 50% of their normal yields. And so there were great costs to the economy of Texas. And the rural population was cut in half because people who were trying to make it with farms couldn't make it and moved to the cities. And an interesting thing about that demographic change, it was kind of permanent in that when the drought was over, people did not move back uh, to, to rural areas. This trend of rural to urban migration is, continues and is projected to continue throughout the 21st century. Okay, now we're going to, that was 1950s, now we're going to roll the clock forward to the 2011 drought, or I call it the 2011 drought, it should be the drought that started in 2011, because it is actually, as we'll see, still ongoing. So you can see all of these, uh, anywhere that's colored is in drought, anywhere that's uncolored is not in drought. You can see these adjectives, dry, moderate, severe, extreme, and exceptional. The colors are getting warmer and warmer. Um, we may need a new adjective. I don't know what we'd come up with if there was something more than a than, a, than exceptional. And you could see in the fall of 2011, there was this chocolate donut fixed right over uh, the state of Texas. As I said, that drought was severe then. We'll talk about the costs, but the drought is still ongoing. This is in January this year. Just before I came here, I looked. The latest thing that was posted on the U.S. Drought Monitor is for this morning. And the map looks a lot like this, except California's drought is getting a little bit more intense and wider. And so the locus of the drought has shifted from uh, having center over Texas to over, over California. And we can see many parts of the state are still in drought. Even though we've been experiencing rainfall, hopefully we'll continue to get that rainfall. So now let's look at the drought impacts in terms of costs. The cost to the Texas economy is for that one year is $8.7 billion. Right? So that's already now more than a couple of times larger than the 1950s drought, which was, what, $3.5 billion per year? Okay. Those costs are based solely on loss of livestock and loss of crops. Right? Those, are the, those are the costs involved with that. There are the worst wildfires in Texas history. If anyone who's been to Bastrop in the last few years has seen the effects of these uh, really intense fires. Uh, it was the first time that the LCRA denied water to downstream rice farmers in the history of their being um, dammed up Colorado River, which goes back to the 1930s. So the first time in 80 years that Everybody who wanted water from the Colorado could not get it. And does anybody remember that Texas A&M did a survey of the number of trees in the state that were lost during this uh, drought period? And not due to just fires, but due to fires and just mortality from not having enough water. So they died, but they're still standing. Anybody recall the number that Texas A&M came up with in their survey? I'll give you the first uh, digit. It's a three. Three. 300, that's, that's preposterous, that's a huge number. 300 million trees? The first number is a three. Does anybody want to hazard a guess? Yes. Three billion. Three billion, you're getting even more preposterous. That's, does the state even have three billion trees? Well, actually, you're exactly right. It's three, it was 300, 301 million trees were lost. That's pretty remarkable, isn't it? Okay, let's uh, try to figure out how that adds to the cost of what the state has experienced, right? It's not just agricultural losses, crop losses. It's not just livestock losses. But there's very real value in a tree. How can we place value on a tree? OK, so I want you to now, um, on, your, on, your, on your paper, I want you to write down uh, three things that you find value in, in a tree. What's so good about a tree? Write down three things. And I'm going to list a bunch here. And as I list them, you just raise your hand if you've got it down there. Shade, soil erosion, 
prevention, water infiltration, water quality, carbon sequestration, habitat, the various species, food, oxygen, yes, aesthetics, awesome, you got them all. Okay, what value then? All of these ecosystem services, all of these natural capital features, what value can we place on a tree? How much is a tree worth? I want to figure this out. So I tried to figure this out. I wanted to find the cheapest tree possible. I went to Home Depot and got this tree, 1998. So 20 bucks. Um, any, go ahead and write down what you think a tree is worth. All right, here's one example. Here's the cheapest one I could find. Just write down with a dollar sign how much you think a tree is worth. I like to go through this, through this exercise. So here's some other examples. This is one example. Now here's some other examples. Presence of trees increased the sale price of houses in East Portland neighborhoods by an average of about $9,000. It's another way to value a tree if it increases the price of your home. Here's another way to value a tree. In uh, 2005, we won the national championship. I say we as if I had something to do with it. And the, this is the south end of the end zone. The north end of the end zone similarly was open like this. And money was found within four months of that championship. Uh, it was about $49 million to close the, south, the, the north end of the end zone, create 20,000 more seats, more revenue. Now, instead of 80,000, about 100,000 people can come to a game and cheer on our longhorns. Well, there were some live oak trees that had to be moved that were right where they wanted to close off that end zone. And there was a cost associated with those trees. We could put value on those trees and the cost that it took to move these things. It was a pretty significant operation to move these trees, and they were valued, how much do you think it costs to move those trees? It was between 15 and 20,000 per tree to move those. So maybe that's an upper end of the trees. So what do you think might be a good average? 10, $10,000? You know what, I'm gonna be really conservative. I'm gonna knock you down to $1,000 for a tree. Okay, I'll just say it's $1,000. So. What did the state lose in 2011 if it's $1,000 a tree? It's 301 million with three more zeros, right? How much is that? Somebody help me? 301 million and add three zeros. 301 billion. 301 billion. How does that compare with the losses from the, that was estimated based on livestock and agriculture? Remember what that number was? That was 8.7 billion. So 300 billion versus 8.7. We're not even taking into account that into account. And I would submit to you that until we start valuing and monetizing these ecosystem services, these things that are threatened by climate change, we're not going to move forward very quickly at all. And I think it requires us to really understand the value of what these climate change impacts are to affect change. So now uh, to wrap things up, I want to talk about some uh, new, new data that's come out, new climate model projections. Here's the proxy, an instrumental record giving us the past for the central plains and for the southwest. This is the drought index again, from the year 1000 again to the year 2100 again. Now it's all on one panel, and what you could see are the very dry periods of the 1100s and the 1200s. And you could see the dramatic drop off here as we go late in the 21st century. Right? This, this is what is the title of the paper. This comes from the paper with the title, Unprecedented Change. As you could see, even with these mega droughts back in early history of Texas, a thousand years ago approximately, there's nothing that compares to what's being projected for the future, right? This is the unprecedented part of what I said, my remarks at the beginning. So given that, the state surely has a plan of action for dealing with the future. Right, and now I'd like to present to you the state's plan of action. This is great. This is the first audience that's never snickered when I said I'd like to present to you now the state's plan of action. So there was a bill introduced by Senator Rodney Ellis, Senate Bill number 988, that said not later than September 1 of each even numbered year, each of the following entities shall publish a climate adaptation plan that will assess the entity's role with respect to climate change. What do we mean by these entities? What are these entities? Well, there is 14 state agencies, Department of Agriculture, the Commission on Environmental Quality, Parks and Wildlife, Public Utility, Forest Service, Texas Water Development Board. These are all agencies that 
would be impacted by climate change. All right? And what this bill is saying is that when you're undergoing planning, make climate change one of the things that you take into account. That's the essence of the bill. It's making no attribution as to what's causing climate change. I was asked to testify on this bill. I was told to get there uh, 8.30 a.m. sharp because we had to get started right away to be sure to be on time. I was never a half hour early for anything in my life, but I was for that. Long story made short, 6.30 p.m. I was called up to testify. That's a day I will never forget because I learned how things worked in the legislature, things I probably should have known already, but among them, that you just can't propose any bill and uh, expect to have it passed. The bill has to have a fiscal analysis. There was a fiscal analysis done on this bill. It said no fiscal implication to the state is anticipated. And why is that? Well, that's because all of these agencies has half as part of their charge anyway, planning. And all it's saying is when you're doing that planning, make climate change one of the things you take into account. How many people think this is a conservative approach and a useful first step for going forward for the state of Texas? Okay, all right. How many people think it's not a conservative approach? And uh, we need, this is a dumb thing to do. It's a dumb thing to do. We shouldn't even start with this. How many people think we shouldn't even start here? Okay, so that was about 15% reporting. That's awesome, 15% saying yes, 0% saying no. Um, I expect by election day, the, uh, the percentage, percentage participation to go way up. So that's the summary. These agencies would take climate change into account in their planning, no new costs. Now I'd like to show you some testimony on this bill. And the testimony was given by several people. This one up here is uh, me testifying. I'll spare you that because it's a lot of what I've told you about already. And then someone representing the Texas Eagle Forum testified and started off here saying, um, we believe that humans have nothing to do with the weather outside. Texas Eagle Forum is, builds itself as a conservative think tank. And here's their, here's their closing remarks. You have to listen carefully. Her voice is kind of soft. Uh, I'll close. I have to tell you, I believe that uh, God put humans here. Uh, God put the earth here for humans. He didn't put humans here for the earth. And God put the earth here for humans. He didn't put humans here for the earth. Wow. So I'm no Bible scholar, but with a, with a quick search on the Internet, I was able to find many passages that talk about how the Lord wants us to be responsible stewards of what the Lord has given us. Um, Pretty remarkable is what I would say. So how does a bill like this ultimately become a law, right? It's on its way to becoming a law, testimony on both sides. And how it becomes a law is. Oh. And basically, that's how a bill becomes a law. <laughs> OK, Chandler Bing, sometimes funny, but rarely helpful. So <laughs> here are the actions that took place on this Senate bill. I won't read them all to you. It was introduced. Uh, in February of that year, and testimony was taken in the committee, March 19th, 2009. That's a day I'll never get back. And ultimately, it failed to receive an affirmative vote in the committee, so it was basically killed. Didn't even make it out of the committee. Um, that was the Senate Bill 988. The same bill was introduced in 2011. It actually made it out of the committee, but died in the legislature. It was never considered. The session ended, and it just withered on the vine. Uh, I was on sabbatical in, uh, during this time, and I was not available to testify. Uh, the, bill was, the bill was killed. But here we go. It's been filed for this legislative session, this biennium, and hopefully it will come up for consideration. And so I would welcome you to write on your index card. I want to crowdsource the testimony that I will give. Uh, the, this, the legislative aides have asked me to uh, testify again on this bill. And I want to hear you just put down a bullet point or two. What do you think is the most important point that should be made to the Texas legislature about this bill? All right. If you think it's a, a, certainly a first step that we should take moving forward. Okay, so I want to give you now this thumbnail guide to Texas planning. So to give you this thumbnail guide, you're going to have to uh, exercise your fingers and your thumbs and your arms. You're going to have to stretch them out. All right, this is going to require 100% participation. All right, so go like this to stretch them out. All right, you're getting ready for your Pilates class? Okay, so now here's what you do. Make right angles with your thumbs and your fingers. All right, and then be able to slide your thumbs back and forth so you're creating this sort of rectangular window that you're going to look through. 
And now what I want you to do is with your thumbs, I want you to cover up this bottom panel. Okay? And then with your right hand, cover up the green projections. With your left hand, cover up the thing that says observations. All right? If you've done this right, if you, what you should just see, the only thing you should see is from 1900 to 2000, right in here, if you've done this correctly. All right? Because that is what Texas uses for its planning. It ignores climate change in the future. And if you think uh, John Stewart last night was funny in the testimony given by state workers in Florida in which they were forbidden to use the word climate change, uh, you should spend a day in the Texas legislature because that is the only data that is used. They ignore the future climate projections. They ignore the proxy record construction that shows much more extended droughts in the past than the drought of record that's being used for planning. Okay, so I want to wrap things up by giving you some opinions. And basically, it's an opinion about the question, why do we have this inability to deal with the future? If there is the best available information says we are facing some significant, maybe unprecedented changes, why are we unable to move forward? Why does the most innocuous first step towards even saying, let's think about climate change as a state, why does that not even succeed? Why do we have this real hard time considering things in the forward direction. I think there's a lot of reasons. People, maybe they're not informed. Maybe they're not capable of understanding. It's just too complex, perhaps. Maybe they're driven by some long-held convictions, right? By religion, by just people don't like change. Let's not stop what we're doing. Let's not change our lifestyle, because change is not good. Or maybe we have to let the economy grow, in spite of what things might be like if we don't, if we don't do anything in the, in the future. Maybe we don't want to know the bad news. There's an example of AIDS patients who, when they get to a certain stage of their disease, when they go to the doctor, they don't want any prognosis. They don't want to hear about it. They just go to the doctor for the prescription for the meds. They say, I, I don't want to hear anything. Just give me my medication. Maybe you don't want to know the bad news. Maybe there's a general distrust in science and in government. But for me, there's one most significant cause in this inability to deal with the future for me, and that's the state of K-12 science education in this country, that I think because Students are so disengaged because of how science is taught in K-12 curriculum, I think there is a, a real disengagement with science. There's a real lack of literacy with science. Not saying everyone has to become a scientist, but everyone needs to be scientifically literate so they can understand these kinds of issues that they're voting on and that their future depends on. And until we change that, I think we're going to make very little progress in this area. For me, there's one real standout example of the state of science education in this country. And it has to do with this, the hoax by NASA. What do you mean by the NASA hoax? Actually, many people now understand that we never landed on the moon, right? It was all a hoax perpetrated by NASA and our government. And why? Well, it was the 60s. We were in a Cold War with the Russians. We needed to beat the commies at everything, including the technological advancement of landing on the moon. We were in a, we were in a race to space. And at some point, as the thinking goes, at some point, we saw technologically it was too hard. We weren't going to do it. We couldn't make it, but we still needed the prestige, so we faked it. Okay, how did we fake it? Well, uh, Hollywood Sound Studio, or go out in the desert in Arizona, a lunar-looking landscape, and rig it all up, and fool the entire world that we actually did this. Well, you have to say, well, you know, these are people who wear tinfoil hats and still believe that there's a flat Earth um, there's a Flat Earth Society, still some of the members of that. No, there's actually quite a large number of people. So uh, some of the thinking goes in this pseudoscience pursuit goes like this. Well, if we really landed on the moon, and this is from websites, from movies, from books, there's a large volume of literature produced. If this was really the moon, flags can't be waving in the breeze. There's no atmosphere on the moon. Without atmosphere, there can't be pressure gradients. There can't be winds. This, is, this shows, this along with 83 other things like this shows that it was a hoax. But in fact, if you talk to the astronauts, they're like, oh yeah, what happened is we stuck this thing in. There's this telescoping rod that came out along the top, and we bent it by accident. It got stuck, and it got stuck in that position. We had a conversation for a few minutes to decide, should we continue trying to fix it, or should we move on to some more mission-critical stuff? And one of them said, well, it actually looks kind of cool like that. Let's just leave it like that. So there's an explanation for everything. However, you think that would be enough to satisfy people who understood the scientific method. Well, actually 27% of Americans in this age bracket 
according to this poll, now doubt we ever went to the moon. Think about that. If you do the math in terms of the number of in this country that are of that age range, that's tens of millions of people believe we never went to the moon. To me, if K-12 science education really taught the scientific method and got people engaged and enthused about science and people understood that scientists and engineers are in it for the integrity of the method, for making great achievements as opposed to trying to fool people, they would never believe, no one would ever believe that all these scientists and engineers got together to put on this hoax. Right? However, that's a large number of people. That's really discouraging. To me, that underscores something that we have to change, is how we go about teaching people and getting them enthused about science. And so, how many people worked on the moon landing? Anybody know how many people are involved in this hoax? Take a guess. 1,500? 400,000 people landed Apollo 11 on the moon. So think about that. 400,000 people and not one of them caved in. There's not one deathbed confession saying it was all a hoax. There's not one tell-all book and go on Oprah and, and make millions of billions of dollars. How is that possible? That tells me people don't understand the integrity of the scientific method. And there's more evidence that, th this, that this was a hoax. Right? All these guys cheering, all these nerdy guys at NASA, all cheering, yeah, we did it. What did they do? We fooled the whole world. We accomplished this. And not just the people at NASA, but our commander in chief. He was in on it too. They called him Tricky Dick, right? Richard Nixon, he was known to do lots of nefarious things. Of course he was in on it. He was the ringleader. He made this call from the White House, live from the moon. Live from moon, yeah, like that's real, right? He called it the most historic phone call ever made when he talked in his diary, when he talked to those astronauts in an interplanetary conversation. Yeah, right, like that ever happened. And his chief of staff, H.R. Halderman, who's the leader of the Merry Pranksters who did Watergate and things like that, he noted the president was elated by the moon landing, clapped and shouted hooray when Armstrong stepped from the moon. Okay, I'm gonna to count to three. I want you to clap and shout hooray, okay? One, two, three. Okay, now where does that take you back to? When was the last time you did that? For me, it was preschool, all right? And I never went to preschool, all right? So it's, who, what grown person goes, hooray? What grown person do you know? How foolish did you feel doing that? This proves this never happened. It was all a hoax. All right, so how in the Environmental Science Institute we're trying to change um, K-12 science education is by having really dynamic speakers talking about exciting stuff. If any of you guys went to the last one, it was by Professor, Professor Michael Weber, who's spoken, I'm sure, in this uh, energy symposium. Uh, how we bring the best science at the university through the most exciting speakers out to anybody in the public. If you've never been to it, as Varun told you about, um, it's quite a lot of fun. And here's where you can go find more information, for, find more information about that. Okay, there's that testimony again. Just as a reminder, I would like to hear from you what you think the most important points should be if I get to testify again to the Texas State Legislature. So then, just to leave you with some takeaways, number one, Texas's paleo climate record reveals droughts that are much longer on the decadal to century scale, time scale than droughts of the instrumental record, which are only six years long. Projections for the 21st century in Texas climate range from significant to unprecedented drought conditions. And the third takeaway here is the state is currently without a plan for addressing these changes. The Department of Defense is making a plan. The state of Iran is making a plan. The state of Texas is currently without a plan and currently not accepting any ideas about making a plan. Thanks for your attention. I just want to remind you guys before we go to questions, uh, there's a sign-in sheet, so put your email and uh, you can be on the list for the flyer. Uh, we do this every week, we have speakers. Uh, let's take questions. Any questions? Over here. Oh, please pass the cards to the aisle <clears throat> and, uh, and then pass them forward from the aisle. <clears throat> If your, name's, if your name and UTE ID is on it, then I will consider revising your grade from Sustaining a Planet. <laughs> Retroactively. Yes, sir. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. 
Howdy, sir. My name is Kevin Murrell. I'm a master's student at the OBJ School. I appreciate your talk. Uh, climate change is a heated... I'm over here. Sorry. I don't oh, know if you're looking for me. Um, climate change is a very heated topic uh, for many reasons. He, he's actually working on legislation right now. Okay. You got me, John? I was wondering where you were. Anyway, um, I've become rather... Uh, suspecting of computer models that project out into the future because a lot of times they're based on statistics that are collected. And I, I was wondering, I'm not going to question the veracity of your projection, but I was wondering, have you ever turned your projection around backwards, looking at the past to verify how accurate it is? Mm -hmm. Yeah, in fact, that's how the models are basically developed. They're developed, then they're basically run against some past conditions and compared against the past record. And when they don't match well, then it's back to the drawing board to try to understand what is it about the physics of the model that isn't being well understood. So in fact, that's done all the time with the models. Uh, it's a really good point. The models uh, have uncertainties, not only within them, but between them. I showed you that a uh, couple of those curves. Uh, on the first panel, it was one selected out of 19 models from the fourth assessment report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. The later one from the 2015 paper was 17 uh, climate model projections all averaged together. But if you, looked at, if you looked at them all separately, no two of them would agree. And no one of them is right, right? All by, I love uh, Robert Mace, who, who's coined the phrase, I think he coined the phrase, all models are wrong, right? By their very nature, they're models. They're not, sim they're not exact replications of what's going to happen. However, if you look at all of the models, which are created by different researchers around the world, and they take different uncertainties into account different ways. There's some things that are very robust and well-known. You add double greenhouse gases, you know what the temperature effect will be. The models are in really strong agreement that way. However, if you look at differences between the teleconnections between tropical Pacific sea surface temperatures and rainfall, say, in Texas, they're not all in good agreement. They differ in that part of it. What you look at the overall result is that the models all show the same thing, is pronounced drying as we go forward in the 21st century even though every model curve is different. They don't sit on each other hand to glove at all because the way they account for things like these teleconnections, things like the role of aerosols, things like the role of clouds, these are all things that climate scientists don't have a thorough understanding of the physics of how they work. And, but it's getting better all the time because new observations are being made, there's new satellite data, there's new conceptual models being built, and I think the models are improving all of the time in that regard. Hope that answers your question. Question over here. Yes. Uh, I may have answered a little bit while I was thinking about it, but nuts and bolts of putting a value on something like a tree or ecosystem space without it actually, let's say, entering the marketplace or not entering in a traditional way. How do we keep those things as they are for themselves, I guess, is what I'm getting at. So your question is how we keep those things the way they are? Yeah, I mean, how do we maintain an ecosystem without actually selling it off? I mean, I heard someone say, you know, if I own all these parts of the cow, I can sell whatever I want from the cow, but I'll, 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 the cow ends up dead. Yeah, so, so my, my goal in trying to monetize the value of a tree is not to say, obviously, we should be cutting them down and selling them off. It's quite the opposite, is we, try, we have to value what we're losing if we don't take any steps to mitigate or adapt to climate change that is occurring. Because if these droughts continue, we will continue to lose these ecosystem services. It's just trying to quantify what we stand to lose by looking at what we have lost. How, how do we monetize that? How, so, how do we that here? right, so, so again, I'm not an economist, and everything I did here was completely ad hoc. Came up with $1,000 for a tree. That's a gross average. It may be right, it may be far off. As far as I could delve into the literature, I have not seen that that's been done to any definitive extent. I think it's a growing field of uh, valuing natural capital. And hopefully that field will continue to grow um, into the future. Uh, and it's not only the field has to grow, not only the science of the economics of it, but more from the policy side, the policymakers have to want that, right? That's the biggest hurdle. I'm confident that the scientists and economists can actually come up with a, with a monetizing system for the tree based on its location, its species, what particular services does it provide, I'm confident science can, can get us, and economics can get us there. What I'm not confident about is when will the policymakers say, we have to figure this into how we make our policy. 
to me, that's the huge leap that has to be made. Yeah. And if your next question is, how do we make that happen? It's a really good question. And I'll, I'll go right back to uh, changing the way policymakers work and what's the biggest thing we're going to do in terms of changing the way policymakers work instead of having this 11th hour mentality. I think it has to, again, come from the one, big, the one biggest thing, come from the K-12 system. So that people who are of voting age will actually say, you know what, I'm concerned about this enough that I'm going to figure out who my congressman is. I'm going to get a good mind to write him a letter or her a letter. Or I'm actually going to vote in the next election. I'm going to vote based on people who run for office saying, if you elect me, I'm going to put value on this. This is the policy that I want to have. Right now, in our state, there's no one running for office on that platform because there's no one that's going to vote for them. And so we all have to turn it back on ourselves and saying, why, why is that the way things are if we all have a vote? I wanted to speak to the, the paralysis of the legislature that, that you're referring to and why we can't plan for the changes that we know are coming. And uh, the, the point I wanted to make was the, the undue influence of money in politics and the entrenched business interests of the oil and gas industry to keep things the way they are so they can continue to make their profits. And so I think getting money out of the politics is the first uh, thing to, to do to free policymakers to act rationally and, and follow the recommendations of scientists. And uh, so short of doing that, I see that undue influence continuing to manifest itself in influencing legislatures, uh, legislators who depend on contributions to get elected. Right, but ultimately they depend on votes to get elected. And so I say until we're going to say, we're not going to vote for these people who are clearly under this influence. And I would even make the analogy, go all the way back to John Wesley Powell. What you said about the petroleum companies, he probably would have said about the big railroad companies. Right? He was not able to get his policies enacted, which were quite enlightened, because of this undue influence of large corporations. And I would say we have the power to change that. And as long as we're acting with a different kind of business as usual scenario, which is how we act, and this is not how fossil, I'm not talking about fossil fuel consumption as business as usual, I'm talking about um, how we choose not to make this a priority in our society. Yes. Um, thank you for your talk, it was really engaging. I, I have a question about like how Texas currently plans for water projects. Um, I know that they're just looking at the drought of record right now from 1950s, but they have like $50 billion worth of projects that they're trying to, to, you know, just to mitigate for that situation. And there's not even enough money really to mitigate for it. So do you think that what they're doing right now is even effective? And is there, do they have to overhaul the entire system even before they start thinking about more intense situations? All right. So you're referring to a House bill that was passed uh, a year or so ago that put multiple billions of dollars towards building infrastructure in the future, things like new reservoirs. It actually remains to be seen um, how that money is all going to be used, how much of it will be for reservoirs, how much of it will be to encourage conservation, um, how much of it will be for education. But the vast majority of it is going to be for, I guess, what you might call concrete, pouring concrete and making new reservoirs and project infrastructure projects like that. Uh, certainly a step in the right direction because we're going to need more inf better infrastructure in order to do this. But if we're not taking into account what the future holds, if we're ignoring climate change, which the state does, then what good will the reservoirs be if rain's not falling into them? It's a short, glib answer to your well-considered question. We are over time, so let's thank Jay again. Thank you. Thank, thank you for taking the time to fill out those cards. I, I will look at them. Return the cards and also return the pieces that Jay passed around. Oh, yeah. Was that a mite or a tight? It was a tight. <laughs> <laughs>